Hi, everybody. Welcome to Top Threats of 2022, a webinar by LNG Security. Okay, our presenters for the webinar today are Sherry Davidoff and Matt Duran. Sherry Davidoff is the CEO of LMG Security and author of Data Breaches. As a recognized expert in cybersecurity and data breach response, Sherry has been called a, quote, security badass by the New York Times. Her professional experiences are featured in the book, Breaking and Entering, the extraordinary story of a hacker called Alien. Sherry is a GIAC certified forensic examiner and penetration tester, receiving her degree in computer science and electrical engineering from MIT. Her latest book, Ransomware and Cyber Extortion, will be published early next year. Matt Duran is the Director of Training and Response for LMG Security, a Black Hat instructor and the co-author of the upcoming book, Ransomware and Cyber Extortion, Response and Prevention. A seasoned forensics professional, Matt specializes in incident response, ransomware cases, crypto jacking, and banking trojans. He regularly conducts cybersecurity webinars and seminars for hundreds of attendees in all sectors, including banking, retail, healthcare, government, and more. Matt holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Montana and previously worked as a blue team field technician and system administrator for over 10 years. His malware research has been featured on NBC Nightly News. Sherry and Matt, at this time, I'm passing you both control of the webinar. Thank you so much, Natalie. It's always a pleasure to speak with everybody. Happy New Year. Um, criminals are always very creative. And every year, Matt and I like to examine all of the threats that we see in the course of our work and that have been written up in the news and that we see in statistical analysis. And we boil them down into the top few. <clears throat> so today, we're going to talk about our predictions for 2022 um, based on the evidence that we're seeing to date. Our top threats this year, number one, mass exploit abuse. So all of those zero day vulnerabilities that you're seeing announced, this is going to continue, unfortunately. And we'll talk about that. We'll show you a case study, walk you through it, and we'll discuss how to mitigate those risks. We'll also jump into cross-cloud attacks. More and more when we investigate a case, we see that the criminals are not just jumping on, uh, jumping in and, and hacking one technology environment, they're hacking multiple cloud platforms and leveraging the access from one to jump into other ones. So we'll show you a case um, involving cross-cloud attacks as well, which involved some real financial impact. Also, exposure extortion is on the rise. Of course, ransomware has been a rampant threat over the past few years, but recently we've seen a shift to criminals just stealing information and threatening to publish it. So we'll talk about why that is and again, what you can do to mitigate your risks. And finally, we'll talk about technology supplier attacks, a little bit different from that zero day exploitation. These are attacks directly on technology suppliers and criminals use that access to, uh, to then compromise potentially thousands or even millions of other endpoints. So with that, let's take it away. We'll jump right into that mass abuse of exploits where hackers are leveraging flaws in very commonly used software in order to, uh, to compromise tens of thousands of endpoints around the world, millions in some cases. So Matt, do you wanna give us an example of a case? Yeah, this is a, a perfect case that we actually just uh, just worked through not too long ago, and it uh, it seemed to fall right in line with exactly what we're trying to say in this webinar. So the uh, case that we're going to talk about for this section is a financial advisory firm that we were working with, and they were using a mobile iron uh, system for mobile device management and for access control into their sensitive applications. As it turns out, and uh, as popped up in the news over <laughs> the last few weeks, uh, it was one of the many systems out there that was vulnerable to the Log4j exploit. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, We'll go into a little bit more detail on what Log4j actually is here in just a second. Uh, but MobileIron actually notified the customer that their server was potentially vulnerable to this exploit two weeks after the exploit had become publicly available. So there was a two week period of time where there uh, was a significant risk to the data that was contained in that server and then anything else that that server touched inside of the, uh, the network itself. So let's go back and look at the Log4j vulnerability that was being exploited. Log4j, of course, was announced in December 2021, and it generated some pretty amazing headlines, like the internet is on fire. 
The reason for this is that it's, number one, it's an open source project, so it did not have a huge staff maintaining it or auditing it, um, but it's a widely used error logging service that's used by major uh, products all around the world. It was a component of Cisco, AWS, Google, many, many other major manufacturers. In fact, there's even a risk that antivirus platforms and other IT software is at use. So really, the ripple effects of this um, were everywhere, and it was not easy for individual organizations to address these because, of course, you may depend on a product, but you have no direct control over uh, when a patch will be available for this um, and or, or even necessarily know that it may be vulnerable. And this was a remote code execution vulnerability, which could potentially allow attackers to directly execute commands on the server. So Matt, you want to walk us through what the hackers could do with this? Yeah, of course. So as you just pointed out, this is a remote code execution vulnerability, which means that if an attacker is able to, to leverage this, they can execute commands remotely on whatever system it is they're going after. It basically means they can run their own scripting, they can uh, they can steal credentials, move laterally, they can download and install malicious payloads, which we saw in a, in a couple of different cases. And then uh, as a kind of cherry on top of that Sunday, they can steal data from the systems and turn it into an exposure extortion case if they so choose. Cherry on top of the log for Shell Sunday. I love that. Okay, so in this case, our financial uh, advisory firm, they've just gotten notification from Mobile Iron out of the blue. I'm sure it took them by surprise. And you hope in that case, you're like, oh, well, the attackers probably didn't find that out, right? So the big questions here are number one, did somebody actually exploit those servers? Number two, if they did, did they move laterally through the network, steal any sensitive data, take over anything else? So spoiler alert, uh, somebody hacked their servers. And that was actually quite common with Log4j um, and many of the other major zero day vulnerabilities we've seen, because as soon as um, information about them is aware, like Exchange is a great example, adversaries are scanning for them. And in some cases they're scanning for them even before the vulnerability is announced. So, so pretty scary. Um, so by the time they found out that this was an issue, they were already hacked. So what did we find? Well, we actually found two things inside of the uh, inside of the server that were really notable. The first thing we found was a piece of botnet software called Mushtik. And Mushtik is uh, traditionally uh, associated with cryptocurrency miners. So they take over servers, whether it's Linux or Windows or whatever, and they install a, uh, a Monero miner that uh, then eats up all the CPU's processing power, uh, greatly impacts performance on the server, and makes a little bit of money for the, uh, for the attacker on the back end. The other piece that we found was kind of interesting to us because this is a name that we haven't actually heard in a couple of years, or at least not in very high prominence. It was the Mirai botnet, which if you're familiar with our history, we've, uh, we've had a very close relationship with that specific botnet. We've used it for a couple of research projects. Uh, but the Mirai botnet is huge. Uh, Sherry, do you want to talk about Mirai? Yeah, so um, thanks, Matt. Uh, so for those of you who have been tuning in for a while, a few years ago, Matt and I did a research project on the Mirai botnet. Um, this was at the in about 2016, Mirai uh, was famous for almost taking down the internet. It caused this massive internet outage. Um, and the way it did it was uh, the criminals hacked into cameras and DVRs around the world and just started pummeling service providers um, that formed the, the backbone, the basic services of the internet. Now, the source code for Mirai was released, and this is a problem for us today because that meant that people could build on it. So initially, Mirai operated by having a list of 60 default passwords, and you might think, oh, it's so easy to protect against that. But many times, vendors would set up these DVRs, these camera systems, just plug them into the network, and then never change those passwords. In fact, when Matt and I did this research project, I don't think you could change the password for the camera, or at least uh, if it rebooted, it was still the same. Is that right? There there are a lot of cameras where you just yeah. couldn't change the password permanently. Yeah, the, the ones that we looked at, which were the most popular nursery cameras on Amazon at that point, you could not change the administrative password on. Yeah, so you can check out our talk if you're curious. I never thought that this would come back. Honestly, this is like the peanuts on the Sunday um, near the cherry on top, uh, because I'm so excited that crypto jacking is back and crypto jacking IoT is back. You can check out our RSA talk on it. We also made it into Scientific American, so there's a cool little article about that. So anyway, Mirai is back, and now that it's open source, hackers are using um, the latest vulnerabilities. They're building in new exploits, and Log4j is one of them. Um, I thought that some of these articles are really interesting. Uh, Akamai did a blog about um, the Zytel security advisory. So Zytel is a product that announced that they were vulnerable to Apache Log4j. And this was really good practice. You want vendors to be proactively notifying customers, hey, we're vulnerable. 
The problem is, as soon as they did that, the adversaries spun up an exploit for that and went looking for those Zytel products, scanning for them and then exploiting the ones that hadn't yet been patched. So it's a double-edged sword. If your vendor announces that's great, you know, and maybe you can do something about it, but then the clock is ticking because the adversaries are gonna try to exploit. In fact, they probably already are. So I thought that was a really interesting observation that was made there. Okay, take us back to your case, Matt, that you handled. Of course. So yeah, after we found the, uh, the those two individual botnets, which were both resident on the uh, the servers that we were investigating, we did a full forensic analysis of the uh, of the servers. There were a couple of questions that we still needed to answer. First thing we needed to know was, did they steal anything from the servers? And then we also needed to know, did they use that access to pivot into any other systems that were connected on the network? Good news for our client at this point. Uh, there was no lateral movement identified and there was no evidence of any data theft. It uh, from the log data that we had available, we could see the uh, the two botnets accessing the server and we could see a little bit of other kind of suspicious looking activity, but it looked like we had caught it before anyone had actually uh, established permanent access on that server and used it as their, uh, their jumping off point to the rest of the network. Bad news though, this was time to fully rebuild that mobile iron server. There were so many questions about the condition of the operating system and the components they were using that the uh, the client and the vendor decided mutually just to rebuild the entire system on, uh, on premise. Uh, and then vendors typically don't cover forensics costs and recovery costs if there's a problem with their uh, their piece of equipment. And this is a problem for organizations that need to investigate because, well, that costs money. Uh, and there are limited options for recourse if that is something that happens. I mean, there's there's some litigation or some, uh, some uh, restitution you can go after, but it becomes pretty tough at that point. Yeah, I think this is a really important point. Again, we're seeing these zero-day vulnerabilities and exploits more and more, but it's not like you can go and t say to Microsoft, hey, here's how much it costs for me to remediate that. Can you please pay me? Um, because if that were the case, tech companies would just go out of business. It's too much risk for them to take. So really, if there is a zero-day vulnerability and you get hacked, you are on your own. And you can try to, um, to recoup some of those costs using lawsuits. We're definitely seeing that happen, but it's certainly not a sure thing. And again, if everybody did that, these tech companies would probably just go out of business. So it'll be interesting to see how the law and liability shakes out over time, I think. Don't you, Matt? Yeah, I think so. I'm, uh, and it's moving a lot faster. We'll we'll go over that here in just a few. But there's some significant changes being made. Yeah. So um, here's another example. So uh, and it's it's not limited to things like Log4J, of course. Um, this is another example. Recently, NetOps is a software that's used by educational institutions to monitor student activity. And you can see this creepy screenshot that Matt found, where you can literally see all these student desktops. So so helpful. You can make sure that the students are behaving. They're actually doing their work. Everything is. Great, right? Except that there's a vulnerability which could allow attackers to take over the student's systems, gain access to their webcams, do whatever they wanted. So how do you resolve this? When you're looking at an enterprise environment, we can uh, jump in and we have logging enabled, we can investigate and determine if there's been a hack. What about all these individual students? There really aren't the resources there to go and do a forensic investigation on each one. And so it's really just gonna remain a big question mark as to how many of them got hacked and what exactly happened. And they're not alone. I mean, again, this is, it's so common for there to be new security holes that uh, I'm kind of tired. I mean, I have like zero day fatigue, you know what I mean? Um, Matt, is there anything you wanted to add to this? There's the uh, zero day bugs in Zoom clients and Palo Alto firewalls, which is concerning. Uh, we've definitely seen takeovers because of uh, zero day vulnerabilities in, in Pulse VPN, right, Matt? I know we handled it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pulse, Fortinet, Palo Alto. Uh, you know, these, these I knew I get service talking providers about that. are. Yeah, they're 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 getting hit pretty frequently with these attacks, and uh, again, I, I don't see this slowing down. This seems to be a you know a successful avenue for hacking these networks, which means obviously cyber criminals are going to continue to do it and ramp up their efforts to make it more efficient. Uh, are we seeing cases where like those VPN vulnerabilities are leading to ransomware or criminals doing other things with them? Yeah, we've uh, we've actually worked a couple of different. Uh, Ransomware, uh, I'm sorry, ransomware engagements that we were able to link back to initial compromise through a VPN system. One was uh, Fortinet and the other was uh, Pulse. Yeah, so watch those perimeter devices in particular. All right, so let's talk about software bill of materials. I think this is your department, Matt. 
yeah, uh, and it it's uh, it's interesting to see that this uh, this is gaining a little bit of uh, of steam at this point in time. As Sherry mentioned earlier, I mean there were there were organizations that had to come out and publicly announce that their software was vulnerable to Log4J, mainly because most people didn't know that Log4J was included in a lot of those pieces of software. It's a very uh, like I said, it's a very common piece of uh, of building material for software applications. It's open source. It does its job well, aside from you know the zero day exploit. But it's not one of those things that's really advertised as being a component. So a software build of materials, which was actually brought up back in May of 2021 after the Colonial Pipeline attacks, is really kind of making a comeback. And uh, software bill of materials is basically an inventory or a list of ingredients for software components that you're using inside of a software suite. So if you're using Microsoft Office, that's great, but what other components or uh, development kits or libraries or APIs are associated with that? that could potentially lead to a compromise. If you have a bill of materials that lists all that out, and you can see Log4J as one of those components, if there is a problem with it, you know immediately what in your network is affected by that, and you can respond a lot more quickly than having to go out and scan uh, individual systems or you know really dig into programming to find whether or not something is going to be vulnerable. So I see this being a, a big change, and I think we'll, we'll start seeing this as more of a request or requirement from organizations before large-scale software purchases are made. Oh, absolutely. Software build of materials, SBOMs, are going to be big in the coming years, so keep your eyes peeled. They're not, and I'm not sure if comeback is the right word, they're not like the Jeff Goldblum of, uh, of uh, buzzwords. It's really more like Billie Eilish, where it's just kind of gaining traction and becoming really famous. Um, so get ready to hear more about the SBOM in the coming year, because otherwise it's just not sustainable for organizations to be tracking these vulnerabilities. And I wouldn't be surprised if we started to see third-party software that you could use to manage SBOMs, and, uh, and that will enable us to respond more quickly to these zero-day vulnerabilities. <clears throat> we are seeing that sudden push, uh, again, for SBOMs right now. So back in May, there was an executive order um, requiring uh, providers, technology providers that serve the federal government to provide SBOMs um, soon for their software. And private organizations want that same thing. Uh, and so I expect that we're going to start to see that as a contractual obligation or potentially other laws and regulations over the coming years. All right, so what can you do to reduce your risk when we experience a mass zero-day vulnerability? The bottom line is preparation. Number one, monitor threat intelligence feeds. You've got to stay aware, even on the evenings and the weekends, um, because that's when attackers are striking 76% of the time. Um, at LMG, we do community alerts for all the major ones. So if you want, you can sign up for our community alerts. Check out our webpage. There's a little button to sign up. When you hear about those, step two is to evaluate your risk. So does this affect me? That can be easy in some cases. Hey, we don't use SolarWinds. Um, or it can be challenging. Log4j. Do we use software that uses Log4j? Or do we use software that uses software that uses Log4j? Um, you may need to conduct pre forensic preservation. When in doubt, preserve evidence. That means take an image or whatever you need to do in order to preserve evidence and determine whether a server has been compromised. Contain the damage. That can be um, one of the things that's come up in the past year is use perimeter firewalls and web application firewalls that will automatically update and block the latest attacks without manual intervention. So make sure that you're doing that if you can, because that'll help you contain the damage quickly, again, without necessarily having to have people uh, manually reconfigure things. Do threat hunting when you need to, uh, to see if there are active intruders in your network. Apply emergency patches. Real important to have these conversations ahead of time. I can tell you we saw a couple organizations that waited about two weeks to install critical exchange updates because they were concerned about the impact on their servers. They got hacked. So you can't always wait two weeks, 14 days, whatever, to install uh, to apply these emergency patches. And you need to uh, have those cost-benefit trade-offs in advance. And finally, plan for elevated risks. A lot of times, patches are not available right away. Um, or there, you'll see a series of patches, and the early ones only partially address the issue. And we need to compensate by extra monitoring, by remaining very diligent. All right, with that, why don't we jump in and talk about cross-cloud compromise? This is where the hackers, it's, it's a simple concept. Uh, hackers break into, let's say, your email or your, your internal network. And from there, they jump into different cloud environments. They're not just sticking with one anymore. When they get to one, they get to two, they get to three. So let's take a real case. Again, in this presentation, we're gonna try to, to give you some very concrete examples of what we're seeing. So Matt, take us to the front lines. 
Of course. So this is a transportation company we worked with who suffered a, uh, we'll just call it a cloud services compromise. Uh, and you'll, you'll understand why we put that generic term on it here in just a minute. Uh, they had four employees that uh, reported back that their payroll was never received by a direct deposit on their, their normal payday. Uh, obviously, that's going to be something that's going to catch your employees' attention. They're probably going to let you know. So the, uh, the client went back and took a look and realized that, uh, that info had been changed in their ADP payroll system and their direct deposit information had been altered uh, to uh, send, off, uh, send off payroll to a, an account that the company did not have control over and that one of their employees didn't, uh, didn't own. So was the cloud system hacked? Well, the spoiler was, yes, it was. Now, how deep that attack went and how it actually started became a little bit more of a question as we went through. So the beginning of the attack was pretty straightforward, and again, this is what we see in about 85% of, uh, of malware or uh, compromise incidents. Uh, the finance clerk fell victim to a phishing attack. And this, uh, this took the finance clerk off to a lookalike Office 365 uh, login page. They entered their uh, Office 365 uh, email and password, and their credentials were then stolen. There was no multi-factor authentication enabled on the account, so the attackers were able to log directly into the email. This is the first portion of the compromise. Uh, now, using that access, the, uh, the attackers were able to move a little bit further, but I, I really want to impress the importance of this. All of this started because of a phishing attack, and phishing defense is one of the things we threw in here as something that really should be in your plans for the next, well, future as far as we can see it, not just year, not just two years, as far as you can go, because this is a common, uh, common tactic that attackers will use. You can take some technical countermeasures. Uh, obviously, make sure your spam filter is effective. Use a web proxy. And then cybersecurity awareness training is key. I am a huge fan of on-demand awareness training, especially these days with so many people working remotely. It's so convenient for people to watch it in 5, 10, 15-minute chunks whenever they want. Also great to have interactive webinars like this. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'm sure this will help you guys keep yourselves and your team up to date on the latest threats. You can have email reminders. Basically, you want to use use multiple methods to keep people aware of cybersecurity issues and have it be top of mind. But it's no longer the case that annual cybersecurity awareness training is enough. The industry just moves too quickly. And as you can see in the, in the image here, we're seeing a lot of organizations moving to monthly training or even twice per month training, and that is very, very effective. Okay, so huge shout out to Derek, um, who uh, our dark web researcher. Thanks, Derek. He went down to the dark web and got us some screenshots because once uh, the finance clerk's, um, or sorry, yeah, once her password was stolen, or that doesn't necessarily mean that the attackers just use it themselves right away. Often it goes onto the dark web and you can buy it. So this is an example of the Genesis store. They sell fingerprints. I thought that was interesting. Cookies, saved logins, personal data, you name it, they have it. Um, here you can browse different packages of credentials. I love this. Um, Matt, feel free to jump in if there's anything you want to point out here. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think the, the line you see right in the middle of that image is, uh, is really telling. I mean, for $14.70 on sale, what a deal. You can get access to Office 365, Microsoft Live, Netflix, Steam, Amazon, Alex, Twitter, Auth0, and more. I mean, it is a one-stop shop for compromising tons of accounts on the go. And uh, honestly, the price seems pretty cheap. If I remember right, Sherry, they also offer uh, like perks and discounts if you order like more than $20 worth or something like that. We'll have to look into that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I, I know a lot of the auto shops too. I have not explored this one. But if you drill down, this is one of them that Derek clicked into. Um, and I think he got this, what, like yesterday? Um, yep. These screenshots are very, very recent. Um, so here you can see stolen Office 365. They're pretty fresh. These were all stolen from just the past month. Uh, Google account credentials, LinkedIn account credentials. A lot of people are reusing passwords. We'll get to that in a second. And the criminals are often stealing it from shops like this and reselling it. So after your password is stolen, it could get stolen from the criminals and resold. And that's what you're looking at here. Accounts Club, uh, Brian Krebs, the investigative journalist, wrote a nice article about this just last week. Um, so here you can browse uh, different packages of information stolen from other dark web shops. It's so beautiful. Okay, so what happened after the attackers got into email, Matt? 
Okay, so as is the case in a lot of organizations, unfortunately, there was a uh, a, a uh, password sharing issue or password reuse issue happening here. The uh, email address and password that were used to log into the Office 365 system were the same email address and password that were needed to log into the ADP system. So the attacker was able to log into the email. They can see the, uh, the finance and uh, payroll correspondence with ADP, so they know they're using that system. They tried the same password, and then they log into ADP. So the attacker has now compromised two of the unique cloud systems that this client is using, using that one single set of credentials. Uh, bad place to find yourself. And again, no multi-factor authentication enabled for ADP and for Office 365. Having it enabled in really either of those places, preferably both, probably would have, uh, would have stopped a lot of this from happening. Yeah, but I think this There's really also, illustrates. Oh yeah, ahead, yeah, this really illustrates the importance of choosing unique passwords. And the human brain is not designed to remember a zillion different unique passwords. So you really have to, to be realistic, you need to use a password manager. Password managers can be used to generate passwords, and you can see in LastPass right here on the screen, this is how you generate a password. You can choose the different characteristics that you want. It will save it for you, and then it can even autofill in a way that is resistant to keystroke logging. So there are quite a few Few different benefits to using password managers. Um, I know many organizations have a policy that says don't reuse passwords anybody, but then where are people supposed to store them? They stick them in text files on their computer, they get fished, the text files get stolen, and they're gone. So it's really important. It's also not that expensive. You can see the pricing on the screen there. So in this case, unfortunately, we have a password reuse situation, but the victim noticed, right? And my understanding is that she, she reported this, correct? That's correct, yeah. She reported seeing some, uh, the only description that she gave us was strange activity in ADP. So there was, uh, you know, that, that spider sense tingling that something was going wrong inside of the payroll system. Uh, the uh, the uh, employee at this point did exactly what she should have done. She reported it to IT. They changed her ADP password only, and then they moved on with the day. They figured if there was something weird with ADP, let's reset that. Let's get it back into a, uh, you know, a good secure state, and then we're probably good to go. As we already know, that's probably not the the you know, outcome here, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it. But again, that is a, that is a pretty common thing. I mean, the, the lack of a, a full view of a situation becomes a problem when we're trying to quickly remediate an issue. So this is a pretty common mistake, isn't it? I know it, we see a lot of cases where the, people had a heads up that something was wrong and they reset that one password and the criminals were like, well, we're still in your email. We'll just reset that right back um, or whatever, whatever it is. So um, when you have any suspicion that there is an incident, you may not know right away exactly what was compromised. But if you wait a day or two days or a week until you really understand what's compromised, the attackers will have compromised you so much more. So you have to take fast action and stop the bleeding. And I know often we don't want to inconvenience users by doing a password reset. It causes headaches. It can be very disruptive. But getting totally pwned can be way more disruptive. So um, when... Uh, whenever possible or whenever appropriate, it's a good idea to cast a wide net on your password resets. And at a minimum, if you're not sure what the attacker got into, reset that email password just in case, because often email is the linchpin. They're in email first, and from email, they figure out what all the other accounts are. And you may not have the smoking gun that lets you trace it right back to email right away, but that's often where it starts. All right. Take us, take us through the rest of this case. I'm excited. Uh, all right, yeah, let's, uh, let's take it home. So uh, Tuesday at uh, 3 a.m. Uh, of the week that this incident happened, uh, the attacker obviously noticed they couldn't log into ADP anymore, but they still had access to the user's email. So what did they do? Well, they went to ADP. They hit, I forgot my password, send me a reset link. Reset link was sent into the email. They were able to change the password, gain access to ADP again. And they were able to change the direct deposit information for those uh, four employees, and nobody noticed at this point that this had uh, that this had happened. Uh, the money was uh, was deposited to a bank in Minneapolis. The attackers cashed it out, and then the funds were unrecoverable at that point. So that's pretty much the you know the the end of the hack. The attackers have successfully gained access. They've stolen thousands of dollars from the organization with just a couple of keystrokes, and there's not much that the victim can do at this point to recover those funds. They're kind of you know on their own at this point. 
So Matt, you've mentioned a couple times the importance of multi-factor authentication. And if there is one thing you do in 2022, I'd say deploy it right away on your personal accounts. I know many of us on our personal email are like, oh, I just haven't gotten around to it. It is so easy to do. It is so quick. It's not as much of a pain in the neck as you think. Um, and also make sure it is consistently up deployed on your web-based email first and foremost, and then on any other internet-facing login you can. Of course, when we talk about authentication, we're talking about verifying someone's identity. We do that in one of three ways with something you know, something you have, and something you are. When we talk about multi-factor authentication, we're talking about using more than one method at a time so that when, not if your password gets stolen, criminals can't just immediately log right in. One of the most popular ways to implement multi-factor authentication is using an app on your smartphone. Um, I really love uh, smartphone apps in particular because they make multi-factor authentication accessible widely without a huge additional cost. In fact, Google Authenticator is free. Um, services like Okta and Duo are accessible and inexpensive. And they can be convenient. So here you can see on the phone, it just says approve sign in, approve or deny. Personally, I like that a lot better than just the code, but the code can be helpful as well. Whatever works for you and your community. Um, any other comments, Matt, on the case or on MFA before we move along? No, I mean, I, I think we, we hit the high points on there. I, the, the couple of things that could have been done differently that were very easy to implement that would have stopped this would have been multi-factor authentication and unique passwords. So again, if you do nothing else, those are the big ones to keep in mind in terms of, uh, in terms of security. I think 99.9% .9 of the cases that we see could be prevented with those two things. Yep. So, all right, the third trend we're seeing is exposure extortion. And we've really seen this ramp up over the past year. This is where criminals are threatening to expose private or sensitive information unless you pay a fee. Um, we've been talking about this for years, actually, ever since the dark overlord came out in, I think it was 2016 and started hacking school districts. And um, I've just been shocked to see how this has continued to take off. Um, so let's look at some of this trend. This is the Karakurt Hacking Team's website. We grabbed this screenshot in the fall, but this is an example of how professional these criminals are getting. You can. This is a data leak website. So an extortion gang has made this. Um, you can see it's uh, well-designed, commercial-grade technology. Most of these organizations have paid staff and consultants, and they're specializing in data theft and exposure. In fact, um, quite a few of these newer organizations are deliberately saying, we don't lock up your organizations. We just specialize in dumping data to the world. Um, here's uh, some examples of uh, the auction platform that many of them are coming with. They're also very good at communicating with the press. Some of them have uh, logon pages for the media. They have an early heads up for journalists. Um, they build relationships with response teams as well. So here you can see they're doing press releases, things like that. So very mature business models. Here's a few other examples of data leak sites. Again, this is a trend. These are just a few. Um, Matt, I know you had grabbed this earlier today. Uh, Ragnar Locker I know is popular. Conti, they're the offshoot of Riot, correct? Yep. And then Lockpit 2.0. So everybody's kind of shifting towards data leaking. Ryuk, of course, used to be very focused just on locking up data. And now again, they have that data leak portal. And they call their victims clients. Very cute. So want to take this one, Matt? Yeah, so the uh, the chart you see on the screen in front of you are the uh, the methods that uh, actors are actually using to extort you, uh, and this is a uh, a chart that came from Orange Cyber Defense. So the statistics are a little skewed towards what their clientele looks like, but it gives you a really good example of what this looks like. Uh, so we had groups like Revil, rest in peace, uh, who are uh, famous or infamous, I guess, for double extortion. We have Ragnarok, we have Lockbit. Hive leaks, and you can see the, the amount of yellow on that chart really shows that double extortion is kind of the name of the game when it comes to ransomware or cyber extortion in general. If there's a way that attackers can lock up your files and hold you ransom with the threat of public exposure, they're going to have a lot better chance of getting some kind of financial recovery from that. Uh, and it's become basically the, the standard. I mean, what are we up to? About 90% of cases at this point involve ransomware and data exposure together. So uh, obviously that's a trend that's going to continue. It's been proven to be profitable and effective. Uh, attackers will keep doing it. Yep. Um, we're also seeing uh, criminals build it into their playbooks. So we had the good fortune of getting our hands on the leaked Conti playbook. Conti, of course, is a uh, infamous ransomware gang. 
and they have created a package of tools and guidance for all of the quote affiliates they work with. They have a franchise model, kind of like you know Dairy Queen or whatever. So this is their pack. What you're seeing on the screen is their package with different tools, um, with scripts that can be copied and pasted, and then uh, and then guidance for what to steal. If you look at the bottom right, you can see it's translated from I believe Russian. Um, it, so it's a little awkward, but. They're saying we're interested in finance docs, <laughs> accounting, I don't know what that third one's supposed to be, clients, projects, and so on. It all depends on what our target is doing. So they're giving the hackers the boots on the ground guidance on what information to remove, what data, what data to pull out. And then um, they're also leveraging normal IT tools. Check out our clone there in the screenshot. We are going to see that in our case study in just a moment. Further driving this trend is the emergence of extortion as a service. And Marketo is a great example of this. Marketo has been around since about last spring and they are a leaked data service. So if hackers steal data, they don't have to do the extortion themselves anymore. They can have Marketo do the dirty work. They hand it over and Marketo will first attempt to sell it back to the victim. And then if the victim doesn't want to buy it, they will actually go and contact uh, any affiliates of the victim. And you can see that in the next screenshot. They'll email competitors, they'll email customers, anybody that they think is appropriate. Um, here it says, hello, we're Marketo. We know you have a competitor, blah, blah, blah. So we would like to inform you, we attacked them and downloaded quite a bit of data. We can give you the demo pack so you can see everything for yourself. So they're trying to get a competitor to pay them for it. They also do weekly notifications. Um, and I believe this, uh, Derek just grabbed, was it yesterday, Matt? Um, or within yeah, the yeah. past, yeah, yesterday. So um, you can see, uh, for some reason, I can't fully understand this. If any of you guys out in the audience uh, have a theory, let us know. But they are actually sending weekly updates to these, um, these third parties, including regulatory agencies, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, uh, the FDIC, um, let's see, the OCC, the NCUA, letting them know who has been hacked, who their victims are. They've also included media organizations as well bleeping computer sc media uh and they're putting their logos here which i'm sure these partners do not want um but anyway they're providing weekly notifications so victims can't hide they're they're included on these lists so if the victim doesn't purchase their own data back then the criminals will then start shopping it around so you can auction first you have to create a login which you see on the right and there's like a captcha because it's pretty well secured it has to be in the dark web and then you can enter the amount that you want to bid for a particular victim's data. And so they're going to try to monetize it that way as well. So this is a very mature system. Hackers uh, that break into networks and copy out data don't have to do the dirty work themselves. So let's talk about exposure extortion versus ransomware. If you want to deploy ransomware, that's a lot of work. Honestly, Matt, you've deployed ransomware, right? You have to go get the yeah, ransomware. <laughs> Yeah, what's involved in that? You gotta go get the ransomware. You have to prime the environment to get ready to deploy it, especially if it's a large environment. You have to maintain the key and map that to the different victims. Um, you have to go through the proof of life process, which means you have to provide customer support. And some of these victims really don't know what they're doing. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, and then you have to deliver on your promise. You have to help them decrypt their data because your reputation matters or people won't pay you. So deploying ransomware is actually fairly complex and technical, and it can require some investment of uh, capital and also labor. Data exposure, on the other hand, is really easy. You go in, you steal the data, you can use normal IT tools, which don't trip antivirus, um, and then you just say, hey, I'm gonna publish this unless you pay me money, and there's even third-party sites that help you do that. So very easy, honestly, probably better ROI. So I anticipate we're gonna see more and more exposure extortion over the next year. The bad news is with exposure extortion, um, there's some risk for the criminals because they have to publish this far and wide. And so we are seeing some law enforcement busts probably create some perceived risk in the criminal community. So that could help keep this in check. We're gonna talk about that more next month in our February uh, webinar, so stay tuned. With that, let's take a look at our exposure extortion case. Matt, I will turn it over to you. I know we've only got about 15 minutes left, so we'll go through this fairly quickly. 
Yep, we'll run through it. So this was a government entity that we worked with, uh, about 350 active endpoints on the system, including servers and workstations. Uh, they walked in on a bright and sunshiny Thursday morning and found that everything in their office was encrypted. So this was all the servers, all the workstations, anything that was connected to the domain had been, uh, had been hit with a ransomware attack and was completely unusable at that point. Ransom demand at the beginning of the case was three million dollars for this uh, this small government agency. So obviously, uh, you know, a big problem for them, and well, likely their insurance company as well. A little bit of a cursory investigation into this showed us that this was an attack by a ransomware group called Avos Locker. Uh, and Avos Locker is a ransomware as a service group that was identified in July of 2021. They've been kind of ramping up since then and gaining uh, gaining traction and popularity. They also are an exposure extortion group, a double exposure, or I'm sorry, a double extortion group. Uh, they uh, they steal data from the networks or the networks they penetrate and threaten to release it publicly if uh, if the victim does not pay them. Also, as an annoying side note, their ransomware executable we found out deletes Windows event logs automatically during uh, operations. So that came into play during the investigation. Uh, but again, this is a, this is a fairly common type of, uh, of tactic, and these guys were following it pretty much to the letter. So I know, Matt, that that made it much more difficult to do the investigation, the fact that there was no central logging and they had gone through and deleted those logs. But step one was just to figure out how did they get into the organization? So what did you guys find and how did you find it? Well, we uh, we looked at the event logs that were available on the network from after the ransomware hit, because after detonation, logs obviously started repopulating, so we had some view. Uh, we saw some strange activity originating from their Exchange server that was uh, remote connections from Exchange into the domain controller and the file server in the minutes directly after the ransomware had finished executing. Uh, we did have some elements that we could pull back off those systems. So we had IIS logs, registry hives, and some other pieces of uh, some information. And then we actually had a backup of the Exchange server that was from the day before the ransomware hit that was uh, was very useful for us. Really, what we saw was pretty telling. We saw suspicious connections directly after detonation coming from that Exchange server using a uh, an administrator account. Uh, we found operating system indicators consistent with three very specific CVEs that uh, came out right in about April of 2021. Uh, we found web shells in the users all users folder, and this confirmed to us that this was a proxy shell attack against the uh, the exchange server itself. We also found Mimicats in the downloads folder, which gave us some indications as to how they could have potentially scraped credentials off of the system. Uh, but this is a pretty common uh, pretty common attack chain that we've been we've been seeing ramp up a lot lately is uh, proxy shell exploits followed by ransomware. Uh, ransomware operators like Conti, like Lockfile, like Babuk have uh, have all been using this to gain access to systems, and then malware operators have been using it as well. So we're seeing Qbot and Cobalt Strike beacons delivered uh, via the proxy shell exploit at the same time. Now, this has been a patch that has been out that has been out for a while. Realistically, this was patched in April of uh, 2021. It was added to a full cumulative update in July. So there shouldn't really have been a reason why this vulnerability should have still existed. Uh, the IT staff thought they had patched it. Uh, the IT staff actually did install the patch that contained security updates that were supposed to correct this, but there was an error that nobody noticed during the patching process. It didn't stop the patch from going through, and unfortunately in this case, it didn't stop patch verification checks, just the cursory ones anyway, from showing there had been an issue. If you just checked your cumulative update version from PowerShell, it would show you were at the right version, and everything on the surface would look like it was supposed to be. Uh, this was not exactly the case, though, because those, those flaws in the operating system that allowed for proxy shell to execute we're still there. This actually turned out to be a problem for, for quite a few people, and that was with how these uh, these security updates had to be installed. So again, these were uh, these were identified in April, fully released in July with uh, with cumulative updates, and there are very specific versions for uh, Exchange 2013, 2016, 2019. Uh, all this is available on Microsoft's website as well. So if you have an on-premise Exchange server, go ahead and take a look at it. Make sure you are patched. Most importantly, though, if you are patching this and you're doing it manually, do it from an elevated command prompt. If you don't, then there is the chance for a a couple of failures inside the patching process to occur that are not easily detectable, but the rest of the process can continue and it can look like you've finished up at that point. So the bottom line is, uh, we all know it's important to routinely apply security patches. Um, so we need to be budgeting time and manpower for that and expect that we're going to have more of these critical vulnerabilities. But the big thing is also to verify the patch status. I know we had multiple cases that were similar to this where um, the victim was like, what? We patched this. Um, but it turned out there was some error and there wasn't actually a verification process. So trust, but verify. You know, Make sure you're going back and checking um, because the time it takes to do that can really save you a big headache in the long run. Matt, want to tell us about a few options uh, for tools that we have available to do this? 
Uh, yeah, of course. If you're looking for uh, an automated means of applying these patches, there are quite a few options out there for you. There's a there's a free option that comes directly from Microsoft, and this is the Woo server that if you worked in IT, you are undoubtedly familiar with. Uh, but it offers or it, it offers centralized management of patch selection. So you can update, you can patch based on what your uh, individual organization needs. You can control the deployment, select specific security updates uh, to apply and when they're applied. There are some limited features to this, though, and the learning curve on it's a little bit steep. You also have to maintain the infrastructure for it. Uh, but as a free option, it's not bad. Commercial options also are uh, are out there. And I wanted to point out to you, I know that of the names that we have on this list, <laughs> many of them you may notice have had some problems in the recent past, like SolarWinds and Kaseya and Avanti. We understand that. However, they still offer some of the best patch management solutions out there. So uh, now that they have cleaned up what was wrong in their systems, we highly recommend checking out and seeing if something like this is uh, valuable for you in that case. But keep in mind that even these big powerhouse uh, technology providers do get hacked. Yep. So back to our case, again, uh, we have opportunities pr to prevent ransomware detonation and also data exfiltration because it typically takes criminals a while to work up to that. They're going to enter, they're going to expand through your network, see what they've got before they take any other steps. So um, Matt, tell us uh, about what you saw next in this case. Yeah, so this is the uh, the attackers establishing persistence after exploiting that proxy shell vulnerability. And what they did to do that was install professional grade RMM tools or remote monitoring and management tools. Uh, in this case, they installed the Atera agent, they installed the Splashtop streamer, and they installed AnyDisk. So they actually had three new systems that they could use to access this network. If you were watching when we were showing off the uh, leaked Conti playbook, these are some of the same uh, features that Conti uses when they uh, invade networks. And that's not a coincidence. It, they, uh, the Amos Locker group pretty much followed that playbook to the letter. When they, uh, when they went through the network. Uh, they scrape credentials with Mimikatz, which if you're not familiar with that, it's a, a post-exploitation toolkit that can, uh, can extract clear tech passwords from uh, Windows, uh, used by penetration testers and hackers, unfortunately. Uh, but there was a shared set of local admin credentials that worked between the domain controller and the exchange server. So using that information, they were able to jump laterally into the DC. So this was one of our big recommendations last year as well. Um, again, the, this all could have been detected before data was exfiltrated. So crank up your logging and make sure someone is monitoring. It's not realistic to expect in-house IT, especially in smaller organizations, to be doing 24-7 monitoring. And hackers know that. And so that's why 76% of the time they're striking in, up on the evenings and on weekends. So make sure that you're centralizing that logging. If logging was centralized in this case, we would have had logs, even though they deleted the local windows event logs. There's free tools to do that. Check out Matt's um, logging and monitoring talk from this summer. It's in the Beasley library. And then make sure you're monitoring effectively. Really, these days, um, outsourcing monitoring is becoming standard. So please look at some outsourced providers if you can and uh, and consider if that's right for you. And then test and make sure they're actually, they're actually getting those. OK, so what kind of tools were they using, Matt? Well, they were using tools that we would find in a lot of normal enterprise environments. Uh, these are, uh, again, some of the, the applications that they executed. We pulled this off of the shim cache on the Exchange server, so this was their actual uh, execution history. Uh, we can see them using uh, Advanced AD Find. We can see them using Arclone for data exfiltration, 7-Zip for priming, NGROC, NetScan. All of these are, again, standard IT toolkits that may not trip security software inside of a network. So if they're being used, your IT staff or security staff may be none the wiser other than maybe they're being used at a, at a strange time or something like that. Now, doing a little bit more uh, of uh, an investigation into this, we did find that uh, exfiltrated data was coming through the Exchange server using our clone. So they used the Exchange server, connected it to a file share after setting permissions correctly for it, and just used that foothold to just siphon data out to mega.co. They claimed they had stolen about 350 gigabytes worth of files, and so they, to prove that to us, they provided three sample files. They would not provide us with any other data that showed what they took, but they gave us three of these, uh, these you know, random samples. They proved to us they took something from the network. Unfortunately for them, it, none of what they showed us as their proof contained anything that was sensitive or really of value. These were all just kind of generic documents that were inter-office communications between a couple of people that, I mean, realistically, since it was a government agency, you could get through a FOIA request. So it wasn't anything that was that upsetting to us. Uh, yeah, but, don't, don't trust the hackers. If they say they yeah. stole all your data, make them prove it at least to a reasonable extent because they might just be lying. And they were exactly. mean to you, Matt. They were very rude. They were really mean to me. They did not like me at all. And this is exactly what we were trying to do, just trying to get verification that because there was such a, a lack in log data and because we were trying to do this quickly, we wanted to see if they would just tell us what they uh, that what they claimed they had taken. And they refused to. And then they got mad at me for asking more than once. Now, I want to point out, we weren't negotiating to make a payment here. We were really negotiating to uh, you know buy time for an investigation and to basically get a little bit more 
uh, open source intelligence on the attackers at this point. But uh, yeah, they, uh, they also came back and showed us a really great example of their franchise model. So we were actually speaking to multiple levels within the organization. We had staff members that we talked to who uh, were reported as working directly for Avos Locker. And then we had affiliates, which were their hired contractors, which actually took care of the hacks. And there was, uh, there was notable difference in the communication <laughs> styles between them. Ironically, the staff people that we talked to, uh, based on the terminology they used, we think were uh, native English speakers, which was kind of funny. Yeah. So how can you prevent data from being exfiltrated in general? Number one, consider implementing DLP, data loss prevention, to prevent accidental leaks. This is software. Often it comes built in with other platforms um, like, Microsoft, like Microsoft 365, but it can identify sensitive data, um, prevent data from leaking, block it from going out the door, and alert you if someone is trying to exfiltrate data. Um, again, a lot of times it's already built into software you're using. You can also get DLP software that will monitor both your on-prem network as well as the cloud and integrate both of those. So again, check out our prior um, presentations, the cybersecurity budget presentation. We go into some detail on that and also check out the logging and monitoring presentation for more details. But the best way to prevent data from getting stolen is to minimize it. Don't have it in the first place. Um, you would be surprised to find out the number of times that people have information stolen uh, much of the time, they're shocked because they didn't know that they were storing a lot of that data in the first place. Um, for example, in the Lone Star Law case from the cybersecurity budget presentation, they had 2.7 terabytes, I think, Matt, um, of data stolen from the beginning of time, from the beginning of their organization. And not only did they not need a lot of that information, they were not aware that a lot of it was still on their network. So when you can... Abstain from collecting sensitive data to begin with, dispose of any sensitive data that you don't need, and then consider devaluing your information. In fact, like, for example, use um, instead of using social security numbers, use a less valuable identifier. So minimize your data. In order to minimize your data, you need to have an inventory of your data and assets and be doing that on a regular basis. So that's going to be a trend in cybersecurity for defenders over the coming year, um, because really that's going to address a lot of these data exfiltration issues. So why don't we wrap up our case study? What happened in the end, Matt? So in the end, luckily, we did not have to pay a ransom. The uh, the victim in this case had backups that were sufficient to get their primary infrastructure back online. And then for user workstations, they didn't really store anything locally on those anyway. So they just wiped and rebuilt them uh, just kind of on a piecemeal basis. So good news for them. Uh, Avos Locker did end up publishing the data, although it was almost a month after they initially claimed they were going to. And then they only published it for about 20 minutes, and then it mysteriously disappeared from their, uh, their website. Uh, the client took this time to uh, completely revamp their environment, though. They built brand new domain control controllers and exchange servers, uh, made sure they were fully up to date, fully patched and verified uh, to not be uh, susceptible to proxy shell anymore. And then they took the extra step of installing a new next generation EDR software suite to prevent this from happening again, uh, you know, as a, in, the, in the first place. So uh, in the end, pretty good resolution. Uh, we, we didn't end up with, uh, with significant data loss or, uh, or notification requirements or anything like that, but it could have been a lot worse. Well, thanks for walking us through that, Matt. We have one more top threat to hit, um, technology supplier hacks. Uh, we will be going about five minutes after the hour, so if you do need to drop off, this will be recorded and you can tune in later. Otherwise, stick around for a few more minutes and we will cover supply chain attacks and then do a Q&A. So our fourth thread here is where attackers target technology suppliers in order to compromise a large number of organizations that use a, that particular kind of software or service. So for example, hacking of a managed service provider or a cloud provider. Um, I believe just in the past few days, yeah, January 19th, uh, Shutterfly is an example of a, tech, a cloud provider that's hit with exposure extortion. So their information and all of their customers' information is at risk, um, people's intellectual property, photographs they've taken, uh, packages they've put together, things like that. So they were unfortunately hit with Conti, just another example of um, a cloud provider that's been hacked and the ripple effects impact many, many people. Also, there's the Kronos hacks. Hack. So Kronos is a, a, a cloud provider um, that provides uh, payroll, time card systems, and 
tens of thousands of workers around the country are being impacted by this. So I believe there's about 20,000 workers in the city of New York um, that have seen payroll disruptions or payrolls incorrect. Um, and many, uh, FedEx is another company that's been hit with this, PepsiCo, many organizations depend on the Kronos private cloud in order to properly pay employees and track time and they've reverted to spreadsheets. So this is causing a huge amount of damage right now. Not only is it disrupting people's paychecks, it's causing extra time because payroll uh, and finance clerks have to start tracking information on spreadsheets. And then there are errors. So after the fact, it's going to take many organizations weeks of work to go back, figure out what the errors were, fix them and account for everything. So a lot of ripple effects for this. Here's another one. Um, there was a technology company, NetGain, uh, that was hit with ransomware in late 2020. And what I find amazing and timely about this is that just in the past week or two, here in January 2022, we saw yet another healthcare provider announce a breach because of this. It's been over a year and we're still seeing ripple effects. And they are not alone. Here's a list of all the different clinics that had to notify because of that one technology provider getting hit. And oh, the list continues to go on and on and on. Um, and because so many healthcare providers were affected, uh, thousands and thousands of patients, if not millions of patients, um, were impacted as well. We are now also seeing class action lawsuits. This is likely to drag out in court for quite some time. So it kind of takes me back to the BlackBot cases, um, where BlackBot, of course, was a cloud provider that uh, was hit with a ransomware attack and sensitive information was stolen. And we are still seeing lawsuits. Uh, the cases are not resolved. But we've seen primarily healthcare organizations announcing these, um, these uh, breaches because they are required um, or, or they believe they are legally required to investigate and then report, whereas other types of information may not be covered. So you might have a different type of organization using the same service, maybe even with storing the same people's data, but not reporting a breach um, because the regulations affect them differently. So it's interesting to see what's happening in these uh, cases of cloud hack providers, how it's impacting different customers differently. Usually customers have to pay for their own investigations, which can get very, very costly costly. So what can you do about this? Well, manage your supplier risks proactively. And that starts with taking an inventory. I love taking inventories and it's really the foundation of your supply chain management program. Prioritize your suppliers based on the sensitivity of data they hold and the criticality of access that they have to your environment and your information. Make sure you assign responsibility for vendor vetting, otherwise it won't happen. Somebody's gotta be in charge. It's a good idea to standardize as much as possible. So I like to see a standard questionnaire and that way um, you can save yourself time as you go through this vetting process. You wanna include cybersecurity clauses in your contracts. Don't expect your suppliers to just respond to you with the information you want unless there's some requirement for them to do so. Some of them are nice and do that. Some of them say, eh, I'm not required to do that, so we're not gonna, and you're in a three-year contract, sorry. Um, limit supplier access when you can. Again, much like minimizing your data, limiting access can limit your risk. And finally, for your key suppliers, involve them in your response planning. Otherwise, you may have an expectation that Microsoft will call you back in a certain amount of time. But unless you actually talk to them and understand what their expectations are, not Microsoft specifically, but any supplier, um, then you may be practicing uh, your incident response planning and processes without having a realistic expectation. So make sure you identify those key suppliers and you involve them when you're planning for your response. All right, there have been so many hacks of technology providers from Kronos to SolarWinds to BlackBot to Shutterfly to NetGain to Tyler Technologies from a couple years ago and many, many others that we're starting to see movement um, it, from regulators and legislators. So here's a couple examples. Um, just in the past few months in the UK and the United States, we're starting to see financial industry regulators really taking some action. So in the UK, they're starting to step up scrutiny of these cloud 
computing providers. In the United States, we had a major leap forward this fall when banking regulators banded together and issued a 36-hour cybersecurity breach notification requirement. And the interesting thing about this is it applied to banks, but also to bank service providers. So any technology providers that a bank relies on, if there is some kind of disruption that could impact a bank's operations, they need to notify the bank, which may in turn need to notify regulators. This is not necessarily a public notification. It's, um, I actually think it's a fairly well-crafted law and not overly burdensome. It just gives an opportunity for regulatory agencies to have an early heads up about any potential issues that may impact our banking system. So this is just one example of where we're seeing regulators and legislators really take into account the technology supply chain and start to include that in regulations. Expect to see more of that over the coming year, two years, three years, and longer. And with that, here are our top threats, mass exploit abuse, cross-cloud attacks, exposure extortion, supply chain attacks. How do you defend against this? Matt, do you want to take uh, our, our defenses, share them with everybody? Yeah, so defenses, and we, we, we kind of checked these out as we went through the presentation, and they're, they're very similar to what we uh, put out last year, so that's, uh, well, not entirely surprising. But uh, prepare for mass zero-day vulnerabilities. This is going to happen again, so be, be ready for that to hit the news. Be ready to defend your network in the case that you need to. Conduct phishing training. This is hugely important. Your employees are always your first line of defense against a cyber attack. They need to have the tools in, a, in order to succeed in that battle. Uh, phishing training and cybersecurity awareness training are, are the name of the game when it comes to the biggest bang for your buck you can get with a, uh, a security program. Deploy a password manager. Make sure that you are giving your, uh, your staff the tools they need to use strong, unique passwords for every single one of their services and use it in your personal life too. I mean, why not? Uh, make sure that you are implementing multi-factor authentication wherever you possibly can. The more you use it, the more you're used to it, the less of a hassle it seems, and it just becomes kind of the default for security when you, uh, when you have an online or connected account. Also, it will save you from a ton of hassle in most cyber attack scenarios. Uh, routinely apply security patches, minimize your data, inventory your data and assets, know what you have, know what you need to protect, know why you need to protect it. Crank up monitoring and logging so you can see when something's going wrong. Implement data loss prevention so you know if your data is leaking out of the network. And then manage your supplier risks to put yourself in a better position moving forward, or at least in a defensible position should something happen. Done. All right. That's it. Great. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I'm Sherry Davidoff. This is Matt Duran. Um, Natalie, I'll let you take over and manage our Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt and Sherry. That was a great presentation. Again, we just wanted to inform you that if you have any questions, please submit them in the question and answer tab and we will get through as many as you can. Let's start with this one. In the VPN exploits that you mentioned that lead to ransomware, was MFA in use on those products? If not, do you think MFA would have stopped the attacks? So for vulnerabilities in VPN services, that gets to be a little bit tricky. Uh, we always obviously recommend having MFA in place, but for something like the Pulse VPN attack, MFA on the VPN level would not have necessarily stopped that attack. The exploit was uh, outside of what multi-factor authentication would have been controlled. However, once they gained access to the system, if multi-factor is enabled for other controls within the environment, for other logon services, for other applications, that stops the attacker's availability to move into those other applications and uh, either steal data or you know detonate payloads or anything else like that. So while it wouldn't have stopped the initial entry point, it would have potentially stopped further movement into the network. Always have MFA enabled. Similarly, um, how might single sign-on have made this worse, better, or easier for the attacker? So single sign-on is uh, is a, a great feature, and I love using it, especially in my normal work, because it makes my job a lot easier. It's also inherently secure. That being said, if your single sign-on uh, information is compromised, whether or not that's username and password-based or if it's device signature-based, that can obviously lead to a much bigger issue. Um, the, that being said, the defense against that is basically to make sure you have either a very robust signature-based uh, authentication system for your SSO, or you have a very strong, very unique password with multi-factor that you're using to access that SSO platform in the first place. Yeah, and the nice thing is SSO can also make the response much quicker because instead of having to reset like 20 different passwords, you just reset one. Um, so that can help. Wonderful. Thank you. Next question, are we starting to see cybersecurity underwriting die off? How can insurance companies keep paying these massive amounts at this velocity? 
We are not seeing it die off. We are seeing uh, cyber insurance underwriting really become more refined. Um, we're now into, let's see, I saw my first cyber insurance policy other, like, like we've seen uh, business interruption insurance for gosh, I think 20 years or more. Um, but we really started to see that breach, uh, data breach policy and the privacy and security liability insurance come out around 2010. That's when I started to see my first policies. So we're coming up to a decade now. And what we're seeing is the cyber insurers have collected quite a bit of data and in conversations from them, they are confirming that they now can trace attacks back to root causes and they are really digging in and wanting to know what the root cause is for each incident. Um, and that's a new trend. You know, five, six years ago, they didn't necessarily um, want to fund uh, a full investigation and get to the root of every single case. Now they do because it's going to inform their decisions about whether or not to ensure an organization moving forward. So what we're seeing is that they're being pickier. They are requiring things like multi-factor authentication, um, backups. They're really doing some extra evaluation if you want coverage for ransomware or cyber extortion. We're seeing some more limits and co-insurance uh, being put into place. So it's, it's just more nuanced and more refined and um, they're incentivizing insureds to, to properly mitigate risks, which will actually reduce risk throughout the system. Would vulnerability scanning be a good option for verifying patch status? Uh, vulnerability scanning can be a good option, and it's definitely something that you should have as part of your cybersecurity toolkit. But uh, vulnerability scanners can only scan for what they're programmed to look for. If you've got something that's a much more recent vulnerability or something that's not necessarily uh, widely advertised or implemented, then there's a chance your vuln scanner won't have, uh, won't have the tools to detect that it's actually there. So again, a good component of a system, but it's not, uh, I wouldn't call it a be-all, end-all for uh, for security checks. Yeah, you can configure popular scanners to look for things like that. Like Nessus will look for log4j um, issues, for example. But to Matt's point, you want a multi-layered approach. How about Microsoft Credential Guard to prevent dumping from memory? Uh, yeah, that's a, a Credential Guard is a, a solid system and that uh, that helps stop Mimicats from being a factor in uh, in a lot of uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, it, it's not uh, it's not a silver bullet for stopping password theft. There are still things like you know grabbing hash based on SMB egress or something like that that can be used to to gain access to that information. But it's definitely a it, it makes it a lot more difficult for the attacker that they can't just fire up Mimicats, hit get credentials, and pull back all the or cache credentials on a workstation. Is there a list that exists, perhaps on GitHub somewhere, of common adversary tools that could be plugged into a security information and event management for notification to IT staff? Yes, uh, there, are, there are lots of them. Uh, Message fact, us on are. LinkedIn, and I'm sure we can point you to a couple that are appropriate for your environment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, shoot us a message, and I can, uh, I can give you one of the, uh, the more curated lists that we have access to. Yeah, but also any tool that you use, attackers may choose to use. And that's yeah. the name of the game these days. They're just using standard IT tools and that's part of how they're evading detection. So watch out because they're using our own tools against us. The call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you, Sherry and Matt. Thank you, everybody, once again for your questions. If you have any more, again, there are... Contact info on the screen for Sherry and Matt. Please feel free to reach out to them with any specific questions you have and we will get back to you. My name is Natalie Adams with LMG Security and we would like to thank everyone who attended our Top Threats of 2022 webinar.